News First Newsline. Hello there, a very good evening and welcome to another edition of Newsline. As you can already see, of course, we're not coming to you live today from our News First studios in Colombo, but from the residence of a very special person. And although it might be evening by the time uh, our viewers are watching this program, you, as you can see, it's quite bright outside. Um, it's uh, somewhere around the afternoon at the time of this recording. So if you are wondering um, who our special guest this evening is on Newsline, um, well, it's a person who knows a lot about Sri Lanka's legislature, the most supreme body here in Sri Lanka. He is a man who has spent most of his life in Parliament. Um, he, of course, joined Parliament at the age of 25, and for 33 years, for over three decades, he served uh, in various capacities in Parliament, and he finally ended up serving as the Secretary General of Parliament for 13 years. Uh, without further ado, this very important person is none other than uh, Mr. Nihal Seneviratna, uh, a decorated public servant here in Sri Lanka. A very good evening, sir, and welcome to the show. Good evening, good evening. Um, sir, there are many things, of course, that I need to talk to you about, uh, especially regarding the current state uh, of the country and especially the legislature of Sri Lanka which like I said at the beginning is the most supreme body in the country uh, if we are really serious of bringing much needed change to Sri Lanka. Sir, you've served um, for 33 years in Parliament and within these 33 years you would have seen a lot of members of Parliament come and go and seen how they function. Um, I wouldn't be wrong if I said that people in Sri Lanka are really not happy about how parliamentarians conduct themselves in parliament right now. Was this always the case? Is, has there been a drastic change in recent times? I won't say there's a drastic change, but there certainly has been a change. I joined parliament when I was young at 25 in the 60s when for the first 20 years there was members conducted themselves with dignity, decorum, ethics and discipline. These are very, very important for any society or any legislator to work with. And it is all important that members, all the members, 225, conduct themselves in a way that the general public are proud of them. So there has been a change over the last 20 years and it is very regrettable. Well, sir, speaking about uh, this change that you've said, the regrettable change, of course, uh, people in Sri Lanka want to become better. Sri Lanka wants to become better. But then there is always the million dollar question, how can we better parliamentarians that have been elected by the general public? Uh, there were various uh, times in the past even where people campaigned for ousting all 225 members out of parliament and appointing an entirely new parliament because people were that fed up of the conduct of our parliamentarians. It may be justified, it may not be justified, but that was the sentiment of the general public. But do you believe that ousting all 225 members and appointing 225 new members to parliament alone could really solve this lack of discipline, dignity? Who will be is? these new 225 people if they are as good or as bad as the previous lot? So in my view, electing members to parliament is a very, very responsible, onerous task. And may I s my humble opinion is that a lot of responsibility lies with the leaders of parties when they nominate candidates for election. And mistakes have been made in the past by many of our prime ministers and many of our leaders. But it's hoped that in the future, leaders of parties will act 
with responsibility. Choose people from their constituency or their district, above all, who have some kind of education, who can contribute to the quality of debate, absolute integrity and honesty, discipline and ethics. And they must serve with those in mind. And leaders of parties, in my view, must take the responsibility to see that even during those five years that they serve, they must maintain that and justify the confidence that the leader of the party put in, placed in them. Because if that happens, and there are so many educated people, so many honest people, whom they can choose, rather than choose maybe a businessman with a lot of money or somebody else who can spend a lot of money on the electorate. Those are not the criteria that leaders should look for, in my view. Some may disagree, but anyway, I thought, now that you have asked me this question, I will say that. Sir, you have written this um, very, uh, what can I say, a book with many memories of your life, a Clark Reminiscences. Uh, you've also had a translation of it done in Sinhala as well. And um, while reading this book, sir, of course, one um, chapter that really caught my eye was uh, the uh, incident where Mrs. Bandaranaika's government lost uh, a motion of no confidence by one vote. Uh, it brought me back uh, memories from my time in life, of course, uh, when recently, a few years ago, uh, there was a commotion in Parliament over a no-confidence motion when um, President Maitripala Sirisena uh, removed the former Prime Minister from office, sacked the cabinet, and then appointed an entirely new cabinet. There was a motion of no-confidence uh, that was passed in Parliament, of course. However, uh, it was only after the Supreme Court intervened that this matter was brought to a close. If you could maybe narrate your experience in Parliament at that time and how things fared, now since I've read the book I know, how things fared quite differently back then and how legislature managed their own affairs instead of going to the Supreme Court. Yes, if I remember right and my memory is correct, this happened way back in 1964 when Mrs. Bandar Naka had a very, very strong government in power and when she was elected but I think when she was elected in the 60s but with the passage of time her government didn't become all that popular and parliament was prorogued and then there was an opening of parliament and then what happened was the government of the day moved a motion to thank His Excellency for opening Parliament and promising that they would do their best to honour the promises made. At which occasion W. Dahanayaka, the famous member for Gaul, moved an amendment to say, but regret that this House has lost its confidence in you for your inability to solve the problems of the country. So, when the motion was put to the House, the government had a fair majority. But it came as a bit of a surprise when at tea time, the leader of the House then, Honorable C. P. De Silva, came to the well of the House and instead of taking his seat on the government benches, crossed over to the opposition benches. Was anyone in Parliament aware of this? Well, happening? there were moves that there was some kind of conspiracy or coup, whatever you like to call it. But it then transpired that this was a move which had been planned because Following C.P.D. Silva's crossover, 
about 15 other members also crossed over to the opposition benches who were in the government benches. So when the vote was taken, according to parliamentary procedure and recognized practice, we put the amendment of Dr. Dahanayaka first to the House. And the opposition then shouted, I, and the government said no, because they disagreed with Dahanayaka. So this amendment was the motion of no confidence? Yeah, it was an amendment saying that this House has lost its confidence. It wasn't a motion of no confidence. It was an amendment to the throne speech debate, but right. it was saying. So when that happened, we carefully counted the votes. We rang the bell for five minutes and called each name of the members. And we carefully counted the eyes and the nose because we had a long book where all the names were there. And at the time, there were no digital systems, no, none of the no. current technology. And then, when we counted, we found that 74 members had voted with the opposition. And when we asked for the vote of the government members, they had only 73. So and one vote? One vote. And my heart missed a beat because Mr. Maitri Palasin Naik and Mr. Badiuddin Bauman pounced on the clerks at the table and saying, you have made a mistake. And I was thinking, my gosh, if we have made a mistake, our heads will roll. And we could have made a mistake because when you call out so many names, over 150 and counting. Was there a ruckus in parliament at the time? No, there wasn't a ruckus at all. Then I told the government people who had intervened and found fault with us, Sir, there is another opportunity, according to parliamentary procedure, where the amended motion will be put to the vote. So you have another 10 minutes. So we rang the bells once again. And then we started counting again. And the motion read, but this house has lost its confidence. And then we had a second vote with the government and the opposition. And it was the same number. 74 voting with the, gov uh, with the opposition, 73 with the government. Were you relieved when you saw the same numbers? Well, I wasn't relieved, but I knew that we hadn't made a mistake because that is what some of the ministers said we had made. So the House adjourned that day, which the opposition benches thumping their seats that they had won. Uh, and then I remember one incident, which I may recall. Dr. Colvina de Silva came into the lobbies and he found a member, I can mention his name, Amarananda Ratnayaka from Passar, and Colvin in his very bell, his loud voice said, Mantri Tuma, Tamunan se chande taavine, kohe da hitiye. And that member said very humbly, Ani Amati Tuma, Mama Badulling Karike in a quarter, Mage Karike, Tyreke, Hulangia. It in Mate in the Berihuna. And Colvin was so good with his repart, he said, Tamunan Sege Karike, Tyreke, Hulangia, Ape Mulu Anduam Hulangia. That was typical of Dr. Colvin with a quick reparty. But that is what happened. Uh, Mr. Saniratna, interesting as the story is, the most important part or the most relevant to the current times is really what happened after this motion of no confidence. The government very well had the power to 
pass another motion of confidence because they had the majority in parliament. All of this happened when the government had a majority in parliament and the opposition was the minority. But however, by some so stroke of fate, uh, the government lost this uh, amendment to the throne speech uh, where they said they had lost uh, confidence. Yeah, you're the... absolutely correct. What really happened after that? Because Dr. N. M. Pereira, the Minister of Finance then, was in talks with the IMF in Washington and two of the members, I believe it may have been Mr. Bernard Soiza and another, were also out of the country. So there was also a positive parliamentary practice of the Prime Minister asking for a vote of confidence and we would have accepted it. Mm. But for 10 days, Mrs. Bandarnaika did nothing. Mm. Though she easily could have asked for a vote of confidence. And the, on the 11th day, she dissolved Parliament. Mm. And in 1965, elections were held and the government had got defeated. So that was the difference between what happened back in 2018 and back in the 1960s, how different leaders responded to a motion of no confidence. Mrs. Bandarnaika acted with great courage, dignity and ethics. Hmm. Well, very interesting stories from Mr. Seniviratna and I highly doubt that we will be able to cover all of his interesting stories within this short span of time. Uh, we also have to cross over to a short commercial break. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Newsline. News first, Newsline. Hello there and welcome back. You're watching Newsline. If you're just joining us now, we're in conversation uh, with uh, former Secretary General of Parliament, a man who has spent uh, more years in Parliament than he has at home, Mr. Nihal Seniviratna. Um, sir, we were speaking about this book that you wrote, uh, Clark Reminisces, and um, you started off this book with one of the most uh, interesting incidents that I have ever read. Hor horrific, horrific, but interesting. And um, uh, during our little chat before the show, you said that this is your most memorable experience in Parliament. I'm pretty sure our viewers out there are wondering what is this uh, amazing, horrific, memorable incident that you speak about in the first chapter of this book. What is it? It was easily in my 33 years the most memorable incident in Parliament which I will never, never forget because I almost saw the Prime Minister and the President being assassinated as a result of a hand grenade thrown. If you want me to go back, this all goes back to in 87, in the middle of the year, Jaya Jayawardena signed a pact with Rajiv Gandhi. And it is known that very few cabinet ministers at that time were aware of this. And the two days previously, Rajiv Gandhi was accorded a guard of honor in Republic Square. And at the guard of honor, a sailor took his gun and with the butt struck at Rajiv Gandhi. Thankfully, our security and the Indian security prevented it. And the sailor was taken away. Because if anything had happened to Rajiv Gandhi, it would have been a major, major international incident. Two days later, parliament was sitting. And Mr. Jaya Jawadana had asked his government group to meet in committee room one because he wanted to tell them first and then the members of parliament why he signed this pact. Hmm. Did the members of parliament by the time know that he had signed the pact? 
Yes, I think they knew it because publicity was given that there was. About 10 o'clock in the morning, I got a call to say that the president wanted to see me. But I was rather diffident about going because that was a government parliamentary group. And I, as an independent secretary general, had no right to go there. But then I realized that the call had come from the president of the country himself. And then I walked down to committee room one. And I took the order paper of the day with me. And I asked Mr. Jayawardena, sir, you wanted to see me. He said, yes, Nihal. What is the business of the house? So I said, sir, item one, item two, item three, item four. These are the matters which are due to be taken up today. And then he said, I want to address the members of the house at the start, because parliament was sitting a few hours later. So I said, yes, sir, if you make a request, I will carry it to the speaker. And he will surely agree. So I said, sir, is that all? And I went back to my room on the second floor. Not even half an hour later, my office assistant comes running to my room and says, Sir, the Prime Minister and the President are calling you downstairs. So I didn't know why. And as I came down the lift, there was Prime Minister Premadasa with his national dress slightly raised because I think a small shrapnel had in injured his leg. And he said, Nihal, Bombay Ketan Tiyanwa. So my heart sank. And when I rushed into the room, President Jayavodhana was being taken out. Thankfully, he was not harmed. And his escort and his vehicle took him away. Soon after that, I see Lalita Tulat Mudali on a stretcher which we had provided for in the medical room. And there was Lalit bleeding profusely. And fortunately, I had got an ambulance ready at the member's entrance. And I got them to open the gate at the back of the parliament, which we normally keep closed because through that entrance, the Sri Jayabadunapura hospital was only two miles away and he was rushed to the hospital. And then when I went into the room, it was full of smoke and shattered glass because all our glass windows had got shattered because that hand grenade, which we only later knew, which had about thousand shrapnel, had shattered the glass. And it was later only I realized What that was the body count like the after the in incident? How many people? Well, almost many? all the, MP the government MPs were all there. And sadly, Kirti Abe Vikraman, the member of Akmimana, my hometown, had been killed because a shrapnel had hit his temple. And I think another gentleman by the name of Norbert Pereira, who was an officer of the house, died. So we didn't know what to, what. So at that stage, the first thing I did was to ring up my friend Frank De Silva, who was my university colleague at IGP, and told him to rush the police to parliament and surround the complex. Now, when I asked members what had happened, they said, Api dakka sudhu atak mukadda visikaranwa. That was all. And then we didn't know what it was. And the IGP said, if it had been a revolver, whoever shot it, there may have been some telltale marks. Because at that time we didn't know what it was. So I got all the members of my staff to get their hands 
checked and examined and I didn't allow any of them to go home till it was over. We didn't realize then that it was in fact a hand grenade which had been smuggled into the house by one of the housekeepers whom I had employed. He had hidden the hand grenade in his shoe and our security, though they checked him, found that they couldn't find the hand grenade in the shoe. In the shoe. And what he had done was, he had got into a room at the back of committee room one. And he had opened it with a false key that he had made because we insisted that President Security check every room downstairs. But after they left, this man used the key and got into that room. And then what he did is, he pulled the hand grenade out and pulled the pin out and threw it onto the polished table that Mr. Jaya Jayawadhan and Premadasa were seated. And that hand grenade ricocheted off the polished table and fell under the seat of poor Lalita Tulat Mudali. And there was a hole of six inches. As a result, Lalit's entire back was blown up. And then only we realized much, much later, when Lalit Atulat Mudali came to my room after he had recovered, because I had gone and seen him in hospital and said, Sir, we are sorry about this. He told me, Nihal, your man Ajit Kumar had made a mistake. So I said, why Lalit? He said, when you pull the pin out of a hand grenade, you have to count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, and then throw it. And he, with his defense expertise, knew exactly that. Because if Ajit Kumar had waited that time, that hand grenade would have exploded right on the table and Mr. Prebadas and Mr. Jai Bodhana would never have lived. Sri Lanka would have had a very different course of events that followed afterwards. Uh, Mr. Saniviratna, very interesting conversation of course with you, uh, very interesting incidents uh, that many of us, many Sri Lankans would not even know about. Of course, they can read all about it in your book uh, that you have provided much detail in uh, about all of these incidents. Uh, Mr. Saniviratna, we're in the final few minutes of this show. Just one final question to you. Um, given your years of uh, being in parliament and seeing parliamentarians come and go, if you can give uh, the current parliamentarians one piece of advice on how to better themselves, how to better their service towards Sri Lanka within a very short period of time, what would it be? Well, I would put a lot of the responsibility for bringing back the dignity decorum of the house on a few people. I mean, I hope I'm not exceeding my limits. I would say it is the speaker who is responsible for maintaining the dignity of the house. And if he is firm and tells a member you have behaved badly, warn him once, warn him twice, and then say, please leave the chamber. The next day's papers will give publicity to this incident and that member will be asked by his constituents why to do behave you behave in parliament. like this? So a lot of responsibility. The speaker must be absolutely impartial but either when a government member or an opposition member misbehave, send them out. I think a lot of responsibility is on the leader of the house as well as the leader of the opposition. And also the leaders of political parties, as I said earlier, 
the leaders of political parties are the ones who choose these members. When they nominate them, when they nominate them to go in front of the and people. And with this system of representation that we have for a district, there are so many members, for example, the Colombo district has over 20 members from Nigambo in the north to Kalutara in the south and Avisavela in the east. Whereas earlier in my time, they have, I belonged here in Colombo 5 in Havelock Town in Timbrigasai. We had either Bernard Soiza or Mr. Jaya Jawadana. So the link between the constituents and the MPs became closer. So I would appeal to leaders of parties. In fact, I gave evidence before a select committee of the House and I said the same thing, that leaders of parties must take a lot of care when they nominate members from their constituents. Not merely that they will win, but they will have a sound education, will improve the quality of debate. They have impeccable all all. honesty and integrity. All in all contribute to the development of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, Mr. Nihal Senviratna, for joining us on our show. It's been a very, very interesting conversation. Of course, many more things to speak to you about. But uh, if our viewers are, of course, curious as to what other amazing stories Mr. Nihal Senviratna has to offer, you can, of course, um, read, it, read about it all in his book, uh, Clark Reminiscences. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bending, for spending time. <laughs> And thank you very much to all our viewers out there for tuning in. Until we meet again, take care and God bless. News first, news line.